This video is concerning why and how firms might get together and collude to rip off the customer and why they might not. Now you may know Adam Smith who devised the theories on division of labour and also the original theories for free trade between countries. Now in 1776 when Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations he said people of the same trade seldom meet together even for merriment and diversion, but the conversation ends in a conspiracy against the public or in some contrivance to raise prices. So the economist most known for favouring free trade realised that when business people get together, the end result is likely to be uh, raised prices for the public. Uh, and up top there you've got the gunpowder plot, nothing to do with economics but a nice picture. So collusion, in simple terms, is an attempt to suppress competition, to not compete. Um, a cartel is a group of firms who have agreed to coordinate their activities to raise market price and or decrease output. And that's what we're going to be discussing on this video. There are various types of conclusion. Overt collusion is where the firms or the countries are saying, yeah, we are colluding, we're, we're happy for you to know that. It tends to be quite rare. Best example is probably OPEC, the Organisation of the Petroleum Exporting Countries, the big oil producers like Saudi. Uh, and again, work out why that is overt, because who could police it? One that's perhaps slightly less well known is where Premier League clubs agree collectively to decide upon uh, broadcasting rights. So these 20 firms act as if they were one with the broadcasters like BBC and Sky because they're trying to get the best collective deal. It's perfectly legal um, and it's overt. Covert collusion is secretive collusion where the firms know that they are um, colluding. Two examples that we're going to be looking at. One is the air freight cartel that operated between 1999 and 2006. I'm going to be looking at that as a case study. Uh, and another one that's still going through the courts today is the LIBOR scandal where uh, the big banks were collectively agreeing um, interest rates between them. The final type of collusion is tacit collusion. It's implied collusion or unspoken collusion. And it may be that the firms don't even know that they are colluding. So for example, if an examiner writes an exam paper and says and knows that there's a question on say elasticity of supply, uh, they might spend their time before that class preparing elasticity of supply type questions. They may not say to the class that elasticity of supply is going to come up, but uh, with a nod and a wink, uh, an intelligent student should realise why they are studying elasticity of supply at that particular time. So how might tacit collusion operate? In some industries, there are known leaders. So for example, in the oil industry, it's Saudi Arabia. So what Saudi Arabia do uh, the other countries and firms are also likely to remember that is not tacit collusion because that's a, uh, an overt uh, cartel. Similarly, in the energy industry, British Gas, the, the largest firm, and often they, they will change their price before anybody else and others will follow. There is something called barometric price leadership. So this is where a firm tries out a price rise and if that price rise succeeds in increasing profits, the others will notice that it's going on and they too will raise their prices. Or we could go for a high Nash equilibrium. So on this matrix, if firm B go for a low price and firm A go for a low price, firm A is going to finish up with 5 million. But if firm A go for a high price, they're going to finish up with 10 million. So if firm B go low, firm A are going to go high. If firm B go for a high price and firm A go for a low price, firm A finish up with 8 million. But if they go for a high price, they finish up with 12 million. So again, they're more likely to go for a high price if B go high. So if B go low, A goes high. If B goes high, A goes high. So it doesn't really matter what B does, 
A are going to go for a higher price. And if B are facing the same matrix, they're going to do exactly the same. So we're going to have a high price Nash equilibrium. Collusion is illegal in almost every country of the world. If you just go back to the original definition of a cartel, you can see why. What are the firms doing? They are reducing quantity and increasing price. So you can show that on a diagram by going from the situation that would be a competitive scenario where MC equals AR to the monopoly scenario where MC equals MR. So you can see that the quantity produced by a cartel is lower and the price they are charging is higher. So the customer is being ripped off. Now with a normal monopoly, there are some potential benefits to consumers. For example, they might benefit from these long-term dynamic uh, economies. Um, but you don't get that, obviously, with a cartel because it's not one firm, it's lots of firms. So you get the disadvantages of being a monopoly with no potential advantages. So that is a no-no as far as the authorities are concerned. So we're going to look at a mini case study of collusion in the air freight market that operated for seven years between 1999 and 2006. So what happened there? All of the large air freight carriers imposed a flat rate surcharge per kilogram for all shipments and they did not allow discounts. So they were all not competing with each other. Now, if you look at the players in this, you'll see some really big airlines who are involved in this air canada air france british airways japan airlines lufthansa martin air qantas uh, singapore airlines etc and the way that collusion took place was typically uh, either one-to-one -one chats between the airlines or it could be done multinational but a lot of the conversation and communication took back place by phone in other words there was not a lot of hard evidence for the competition authorities to work on. So we're going to be looking at how the competition authorities actually managed to crack this and other cartels. So the question is, naturally left to themselves, if you're involved in a cartel, would you confess to the authorities? Well, if we look at the situation from Lufthansa's point of view, if British Airways confess, Lufthansa are going to be dropped in it. So if Lufthansa also confess, they're going to be fined with 340 million euros and if Lufthansa remains silent they're still being dropped in it by BA so they are going to be fined 340 million euros so if BA confess it's exactly the same situation for Lufthansa whether they confess or not if British Airways remain silent and Lufthansa confess they've confessed to doing something wrong they are going to be fined 340 million euros but if they both remain quiet, then they're going to be able to continue with the cartel and continue to rip off the public, say, to the extent of 10 million euros. So if BA remain quiet, it's better for Lufthansa to also remain quiet. So we have a weak Nash equilibrium of silence. So there's no natural reason why Lufthansa should confess. But the authorities are going to do something about that. And we're going to go back to classic prisoner's dilemma. So the question should be, how on earth do I know that this cartel took place? Because that could only happen, bear in mind that most of the contact took place by mobile phone, if one or more of the airlines confessed to the authorities. So what the authorities do is they play classic prisoner's dilemma. They give full exemption, 100% exemption for the first firm that picks up its phone and confesses. Now, what then happens is that the next firm that picks up the phone, they're going to get a pretty hefty uh, exemption. And the last firm that pick up the phone, or if a firm doesn't pick up the phone at all, they could potentially be whacked with the top fine. And those fines are potentially absolutely huge. They can be fined up to 10% of worldwide revenue. So in the case of BA, BA make worldwide revenues of about 13 billion uh, pounds. So potentially their fine is 1.3 billion pounds. Now they only make 2 billion pounds profit. So that would eat away roughly two thirds of their annual profit just on that potential fine. 
Now, just as a sideline, you know, why might Tesco not be uh, likely to collude? Well, Tesco have annual revenues of about 60 billion pounds. So 10% of that is 6 billion pounds. They make profits of about 1.3 billion pounds so if they were to be fined this top amount they would lose four and a half years worth of profits the fines are massive and what's more the competition authorities are quite happy to impose heavy fines in the case of the air freight collusion in total there were 800 million euros of fines air france klm were fined 340 million euros they were the ones who confessed last or didn't confess at all british airways lost over a hundred million euros in fines lufthansa were fined nothing because Lufthansa were the first to confess. Now, on top of this, there were similar investigations in the US and they fined 18 airlines, nearly one billion pounds between them. So the fines are massive. So having looked at uh, this starting point, this could be a good place to take a pause and a break if you want to do that or carry on if you want to do that. So what methods do the authorities have? Well, we've already said that they have full exemption plus rising fines again on the top left you can see from the uh, competition the markets authority website that you could potentially get away with it if you are the first to report and confess involvement in a cartel and you cooperate throughout the investigation you've got heavy maximum fines 10 percent potentially of worldwide revenue and the authorities are prepared to do that because obviously if you had potential fines but the authorities never imposed them then they wouldn't have much real power the other thing that could happen is that you can actually be put into prison so on the bottom left there you can see that with the libor rigging trial that former barclays bankers were actually uh, jailed for doing that now on the other side you've got potential rewards for somebody perhaps working in the business, if they're aware that their business is involved in a cartel, they can use the whistleblowers hotline. I've got the number there for you if you see that and potentially they could receive rewards of up to £100,000. Now, typically when I talk about this in class, some people turn around and say, yeah, £100,000, but they're going to lose their job. No, they won't, because if the firm attempts to sack them, then they will take the employee will take those firms through the courts for unfair dismissal remember that the firms are engaging in criminal activity so if they try to get rid of an employee for whistleblowing the employee would basically sue their pants off so they'd get the reward for um, for informing the cartel and they'd get a substantial payout from the courts as well if we take a quick look at the LIBOR rigging scratch scandal now the LIBOR scandal is when the banks were rigging interest rates uh, again you can see there that in total the fines were 3500 billion pounds and in total uh, the banks would have been fined roughly 100 billion pounds between them and you see that these are big names uh, names like rbs barclays lloyds so it's often big firms like we've seen the big airlines we've seen the big banks involved in uh, in these cartels now this actually cropped up in an a-level question the question was about explain barclays changing approach well down the bottom there you can see that barclays were the first bank to be penalised for rigging the LIBOR rate and it was fined over a quarter of a billion pounds. Um, now, at the time this particular report at the bottom was made, Barclays learnt from their mistake. They learnt that by keeping their trap shut, it wasn't going to be good for them. So when there was a second scandal, Barclays were the first to say, yep, were involved in a cartel and that got them off another fine of more than half a billion pounds so you can see how uh, Barclays were using game theory and using oligopoly interdependence so their fine was going to be dependent upon whether perhaps someone else got in before them and they were the first to pick up the phone really interesting case study so these are some investigations that the CMA were taking part in or just finished uh, in October 2020. So they'd spent two years investigating our good old friends British Airways again for carving up the market with some of their mates uh, like Finnair. The second one down 
is a result. So again, for two years, they were in investigating the digital pianos, digital keyboards and guitars market. Again, they discovered that there was a cartel and imposed fines. Third one's an interesting one, um, that they're investigating hand sanitizer products following the COVID uh, clampdown. Um, so under that pandemic, they were concerned that firms were ripping off the public. I'm not sure whether that uh, investigation is finished yet, but I suspect they'll discover that, yeah, the customers were being ripped off. The fourth example shows how the CMA can investigate local cartels as well. So they were investigating a state agent in Berkshire. They found that they were colluding, they were acting together. And you can see again the types of fines that were imposed, more than £600,000. Again, you might want to pause now because now we're going to go into another case study. And that case study goes back to the 1970s where the OPEC cartel cut production and raised prices. So this table shows the price of a barrel of crude oil. Crude is about 35 gallons, 160 litres of oil. Uh, and you've got two columns there. The first one is how much uh, oil, uh, a barrel of oil cost at the time. Uh, and secondly, we've adjusted that up to 2020 prices. So in 1970, you could get oil for $3 a barrel, $23 at current figures. 1974, it tripled to $9 a barrel. By 1980, it had gone up by 12 times to $37. And the prestigious publication, The Economist, reckoned that by the year 2000, the price of a barrel of oil would be $300 which would be $450 per barrel in today's prices. Now, the point about a cartel is that prices and profits go up. Now, your straight supply curve will tell you that at higher prices, firms wish to supply more. And in the case of OPEC, there were a number of backdoor deals. One of the most famous is the arms to Iraq scandal. Now, broadly speaking, from the Iraqi perspective, they shouldn't have been producing more oil because they'd agreed to, uh, to limit their supplies to raise to keep the price high. In the case of America, they'd agreed not to supply arms to Iran and Iraq who were at war at the time. And I think about that, that one. Two members of OPEC actually fighting each other and wars are expensive. And so they're going to want to get money pretty quickly. So the backdoor deal was that America, who needed oil, would supply arms to Iraq, because they liked Saddam Hussein at the time, while Iraq would be supplying oil to America. Similarly, uh, Ayatollah Khomeini, from the Iranian perspective, uh, he was selling just that little bit more oil um, to his mates, uh, such as France. Uh, they, so there was backdoor dealing both ways. Now, either way, they are supplying more than they'd agreed to supply. And we all know what happens to prices if supply goes up. Also, those high prices create an incentive for non-cartel members to increase their production because they would benefit from the higher prices. So a good example would be the UK who are developing naughty oil. Now, sea-based oil is going to be a little more costly to produce than, say, oil produced in a desert. But if prices are higher, then it's going to be worthwhile for countries to do that. So we did it and Norway did it as well. Those high prices for oil also create an incentive for firms and countries to develop alternatives because they are going to want to benefit from some of that higher prices. They're going to want to take some demand away from uh, oil. So they might start to develop alternative fuels. In the 1970s and 80s, uh, particularly Brazil started to, to divert some of its sugar production towards producing ethanol. And of course, since then, we've had a, a range of other fuels being developed, such as wind, such as nuclear, such as solar. Uh, so again, that is going to reduce uh, the demand for oil. Those high prices are also going to create an incentive for us consumers to consume less. So demand for those big gas guzzling cars fell. And also it created an incentive for car manufacturers to produce more fuel efficient cars. Um, and again, you can see some of the long term implications of that with things like electric cars or hybrid cars. So did The Economist magazine way back in the 1970s get its predictions right? 
No, and the reason why it didn't was because of those economic factors. They'd actually failed to look at the economic factors at the time. Uh, remember, in the year 2000, they were predicting that the price of oil was going to be $300. It was actually $27. In 2010, when there was again a mini oil crisis, it had risen to only 71, still less than a quarter of what they were predicting by 2020, uh, sorry, by 2000. And by 2020, currently, uh, we're looking at roughly $39 a barrel. And just have a look at that figure for April 2020, when the COVID lockdowns were starting. The price of crude oil was minus $38 a barrel. Yes, the suppliers had to pay the buyers to take the supplies off their hands. Remember, we're looking at a, a product that's inelastic in supply. It's very difficult to reduce supply uh, with a change in price because basically to cap an oil field to stop it producing at all is very, very, very expensive and could potentially ruin that oil field. So they were paying customers to take the oil away from them. This could be another good place to take the polls because we're going to go into a game theory matrix now. So how would you show that uh, in a question if you get an explicit question on collusion and they do come up where you are asked to use game theory? Well, first of all, you should build a simple matrix for firm A that results in a low price Nash equilibrium. So if uh, Virgin go for a high price and British Airways go for a high price, they're going to make four million pounds profit. But if they go for a low price, they are going to get eight million pounds profit. So rather than get four million pounds by going high or eight million by going low, they're going to want to go low. Similarly, if Virgin go for a low price, British Airways are going to make one million pounds. But if British Airways go for a low price, they're going to make two million pounds. So what would they rather make? One million or two million? They'd rather make two million. So they're going to go for a low price. So we finish up with a strong Nash equilibrium for a low price. So your matrix should also show where collusion could increase joint profits. Remember at the moment they're each making two million so their joint profits are four million. But that top left box is going to show an improved situation if they illegally collude. So as you can see there, if they get together and go for a joint high price, each of them can make 4 million, which would make uh, the combined profit of 8 million. 8 million is better than 4 million, and individually, 4 million is better than 2 million. So basically, they are going to go for that top left if they can get away with it. Or are they? However, you also need to show that where breaking the cartel could increase the firm's individual profits. Remember, a Nash equilibrium is a Nash equilibrium. So in this case, there's going to be a temptation for British Airways to break the cartel and go for a low price because they could potentially get eight million individually by going for a low price, whereas they can only get four million by going for a high price. But if we now look at this from the perspective of Virgin, if they're facing the same matrix, remember British Airways are now going for a low price, but Virgin are going for a high price. So Virgin are only going to be receiving one million. So Virgin are going to retaliate by also lowering their prices. So we're going to basically finish up where we started. Um, the cartel has broken down. We don't need the authorities uh, to intervene because naturally the cartel is going to break down, just like it did with the oil cartel. Still there, but it's not as powerful as it was. So we finish up exactly where we started with no need for government intervention. But remember that that air freight cartel went on for seven years ripping the public off and some of these cartels do last a long time of course in the case of OPEC uh, it's still going but it's got nothing like the power that it once had now you would have spent a long time proving that and you would have picked up one heck of a lot of marks because you would have shown how collusion works and also why it might break down. You do need probably a brief discussion on some of the other factors. So do, do discuss fines, do discuss leniency, do discuss the potential rewards for whist whistleblowers. You can look at how long the investigations take. We saw that there was a number that took about two years. Um, that seems to be round about a typical time span 
during which time of course the public could still be being ripped off. And there's one I found on the CMA site that's still ongoing for seven years in the uh, pharmaceutical industry. We could also look at the resources available to these really large firms. They're going to have powerful legal teams. Often they'll have far more resources available to them than the authorities. So the authorities have really got to rely upon them complying, fines, leniency, all that stuff it tends to uh, factor in there. Um, and we look at the factors that are likely to make a cartel succeed. Again, it's probably a decent time to take a break because we're now going to look at those factors if you want to. So what circumstances is a cartel more likely to set up uh, and potentially succeed? Remember, this is saying what is more likely. It does not mean that firms will do it because some firms, believe it or not, actually don't like to break the law. Well, the first factor is if the cartel has a large market share and so are able to use their market power. So in the case of OPEC, you can see there that in 2018, they had nearly 80% of the share of world crude oil reserves. So players like America and Britain had a relatively small market share. The second factor is that barriers to entry must be relatively high to stop non-cartel members taking advantage of the high prices and joining the market. Uh, in the case of oil, to set up a, um, an oil well takes a lot of time exploration. It also, of course, takes a lot of money. So there are barriers to entry in that particular market. Thirdly, the fewer the members, the better. Remember that apart from um, OPEC, most cartels are illegal and you just need one firm to blab and you are potentially going to be fine. So the fewer the members, the better. It's not a problem with OPEC because it's a legal cartel, but with illegal cartels, one phone call could mean a hefty fine for you. Ideally, you should be able to check what each other members are doing. So in the case of the uh, air cartel, it will be relatively straightforward for each member to check the price of the others. Maybe just make a few phone calls, see if they can uh, act as a customer to place a deal. And if they see that the other firms are giving them discounts or offering them discounts, they will know that they're breaking the cartel. They did do that and they knew that they weren't breaking the cartel. Again, the more homogenous the product, the easier it is for a cartel to work. Because if the products are non-homogenous, there could be perfectly legitimate reasons why prices are lowered, uh, but the other firms might not necessarily see it the same way. So if the products are near homogenous, like crude oil is, then that makes uh, a cartel more likely. Again, if demand is relatively stable, because it's trust that's the thing. If a firm sees its demand going down, then it could suspect that other firms are breaking the cartel, other cartel players are undermining it. Uh, so if demand is relatively stable, then that is less likely to happen. And finally, if firms have relatively similar production costs, if one firm is able to get uh, much larger economies of scale than other firms, there's going to be a temptation for them to break the cartel, reduce the price and reap the profits. So if that doesn't happen, then cartels are more likely to succeed. Of all of those factors, I find the best discussions take place around the first three. Uh, high market share, high barriers to entry and relatively few members. And that is all that I want to talk about. I bet you're pleased to hear about cartels.